Welcome to the second part of our assessment writing support session and today we're going to be covering off on the topic of writing assessment tools related to recognition of prior learning. So just to refresh on what RPL is, um, the, according to the ASCOR website, so on the ASCOR website it says that recognition of prior learning is a process that assesses your competency acquired through formal and informal learning to determine if you meet the requirements for a unit of study. You can use a variety of documentation to apply for RPL. This includes, but is not limited to, records of completed training, any assessment items that you may have, any assessment records, declarations from your employer and or any student records provided by ASQA. It notes here that each provider has its own RPL process. So when you are accepted by a new provider, speak to your new provider for assistance with applying for RPL. And I think that really undermines um, one of the key parts about RPL or recognition of prior learning is that it's not as black and white as standard assessment where you are putting together the assessment tools to use in the future for people who are currently learning their new skills and knowledge. Whereas RPL is a little bit grey because it's all based on history. It's all based on the prior skills and knowledge that a candidate has achieved over a lifetime sometimes. So no two candidates are going to be the same in terms of what evidence they can provide to you for their case to say that they are competent in a unit of competency and no two candidates will call forms that you may have a certain name for, um, they may call it something different. So there has to be a little bit of negotiation around what the evidence requirements are and I think a closer level of discussion between the assessor and the candidate when it comes to determining just exactly what evidence is going to be enough to um, allow the assessor to make that decision that the candidate is competent. But in absolutely no uncertain terms, it is just as much a legal process as doing your regular assessment processes. So every bit of assessment that is submitted in, um, in um, support of a candidate's competency forms part of a legal document and must be treated with care and respect and obviously um, uh, put together it to form that overall picture so you can hand on heart say that you would um, give that candidate a competency outcome. No different to when you're doing it through full assessment. So as part of our practical activity today, we're going to focus on putting together a recognition of prior learning assessment kit for um, the unit of competency called um, BSB CMM 401 Make a Presentation. The first thing that I will mention when you are um, selecting the units that you are putting together in your recognition of prior learning um, assessment tools is that you really have to have very close understanding of what competence looks like in the real world. Because when you put this assessment tool together for RPL, for a unit of competency, whatever the topic is, you have to know what are the typical sorts of evidence that that person is going to have produced over their lifetime of applying those skills and knowledge in their own workplaces. So if you're not familiar with the topic, it's gonna to be very hard for you to picture in your mind the sorts of typical evidence items that a candidate might be able to come and present you. And um, so definitely when you're selecting a unit, make sure it's something that you have done yourself or you're quite familiar with. So you can really come up with a good strong list of what evidence items might be needed to um, put together that unit. Um, from an RPL perspective. So no different to when we're writing full assessment, the first thing that we need to do when we are putting together our assessment tool is to put our assessment plan together. Now that was covered in our prior video on writing full assessment, so you can use exactly the same sort of template. However, your target learner or your um, typical candidate would be someone who is not in the process of adopting or learning the skills and knowledge but already holds them. So you would have a few um, differences there. In a, rec in a RTO world, um, it's quite common <clears throat> for some RTOs to actually have a separate training and assessment strategy for um, RPL. They just call it an assessment strategy because there is no training involved and it is a very common assessment only pathway to um, determination of competency. 
So very, um, very typical for RPL to be offered out there. Um, some RTOs even specialise in RT RPL and they have got a very um, neat system um, determined. From my experience, I think um, there's a couple of things that really make RPL doable for both the RTO and the candidate. And the first one is the amount of effort that the RTO goes to to unpack the unit of competency and really pull apart what are the typical everyday evidence items that someone who is competent in that unit of competency would have already. So really pulling it apart and thinking about, you know, if they're doing that skill in the workplace, what is that producing? Because RPL, with RPL, it's not enough to be able to have a candidate who can tell you how amazing they are at doing a skill. They have to be able to back it up with hard evidence, no different to when they're doing full assessment. So even though you may really believe that they are competent, if they can't produce the evidence and you can't verify that it relates to their own activities, then um, unfortunately you can't be, um, assess them under an RPL situation. Um, the second thing that I think makes a big difference to the process is the candidate's ability to retain records. So even though um, uh, you may again really truly believe that someone is competent and you might be able to verify in certain areas that they have done what they say they've done, if they've not been good record keepers, and they don't have evidence of having completed certain skills, then again, unfortunately, you would have to um, pass on the RPL pathway. So often it can be quite a um, intensive process and some people even say, look, it's just easier to go straight to doing the assessment sometimes. And, you know, certainly that's a decision that can be determined between the assessor and the candidate, subject to what evidence um, the candidate is able to pull together. So the amount of effort the RTO does at the beginning is really going to make a big difference in terms of the, um, the process that is followed and how efficient it might be for both parties. So if we have a look at our unit of competency, so this is our BSB CMM 401, make a presentation. The first thing we do is we want to really pull apart what does competent look like from our evidence and performance criteria and also then our assessment requirements, which are down further. So when we do this, it's kind of similar to when we were doing the full assessment exercise where we're actually looking at these individual performance criteria and painting a picture in our mind of what is actually going on in the real world and picturing it and then thinking about if someone's doing that, what are they producing? What would the actual output or evidence item be that might relate to that particular um, performance criteria? So to make it simple, I think what we might do is instead of working from training.gov, um, I normally just pull it into a little summary called an unpacking summary where it's kind of like a mapping matrix and that just allows us to be able to quickly go through that unit of competency and be able to unpack it by reading each of the individual evidence requirements and then we're going to put that straight into our RPL template because in our RPL kit template um, we would have to um, put together what the evidence suggestions are for a candidate. So let's just put them side by side on the screen and that will show us how we can quite easily do this unpacking exercise here. Okay, so we can see our unit there and we can see our RPL kit on the right hand side. So in the RPL kit, it gives lots of good instructions to the assessor. It highlights that this is a legal process and it's really, really important to make as much note taking and um, evidence collection as you can. So any conversation, any piece of anything that's given to the assessor as part of the evidence portfolio must be logged and must be carefully secured and maintained as part of the evidence collection for the actual decision making. So the process is normally following a few different things. So the first part is that we're going to determine what the typical evidence items might be that would relate to the unit of competency. So when you do this as your assessment um, piece, you would select the unit of competency, making sure that it's one that you can actually have good familiarity with. So you would be able to come up with the evidence items. Then um, we have um, the requirement to perhaps check the knowledge of a candidate. 
So you might have someone that comes along who professes to be a total expert on a certain topic and if you have a five minute chat with them, within five minutes you can really know whether they are who they say they are or whether they're kind of full of it. So as part of that, with the RPL process, we always do that verification by having a competency interview. And it doesn't have to be a full on assessment the way that full assessment might be, but it's more of a conversation. So a conversation around um, discussing what the past history is with the candidate, asking some pertinent questions that relate to that subject topic, um, and just making sure that you get to the bottom of hand on heart, you know that person knows their stuff on the topic. Sometimes you may feel you know, you've got a bit of evidence and you've had a conversation, but you're just not 100% certain that you would have that person working in your business, for example, on that particular topic. So you might get them to do some sort of little observation or challenge test, just to be sure to be sure. So it just gives you that last little piece of the puzzle to make sure that um, that you can 100% say, yes, they can demonstrate that skill. So it is optional and it's usually, um, more, I guess, um, relevant when you've got units of competency that are highly practical. So if it was using a piece of equipment, for example, you know, maybe driving a forklift or something like that, you really wouldn't want to just have um, a license that says I've previously driven a forklift and maybe a job description saying I've worked in that industry using a forklift, you would actually want to see them drive the forklift. So where it's a really practical type topic, that's certainly an option is to go straight to doing some sort of a practical demonstration of the skill itself. And then finally, to wrap it all up, the um, candidate and the assessor will have this final kind of interview to really debrief. And it's really important that all the principles of assessment and rules of evidence are followed throughout the RPL process, no differently to normal assessment. So very important to always have that conversation at the very beginning to make sure that the candidate is fully aware what RPL is all about. Some people just think they have to just tell you about their history and that's enough. Um, some people don't really know what RPL is until they've been through the process. So um, sometimes after having that initial conversation with a candidate and particularly when you can share with them a list of what the typical evidence items might be, they may just say, look, you know, let's just stop it here. We'd probably um, don't want to waste each other's time, let's go to full assessment. So you really need to make sure that you've got good records in the candidate file about what discussions have occurred um, before the process starts and during the process to make sure the candidate is really aware of what they need to do as part of their responsibility in relation to the RPL process and what your um, benchmarks are around how you have to ensure that their evidence items particularly meet those four um, rules of evidence around currency and authenticity and um, sufficiency, et cetera. So this is what this kit will do. It will guide us through that process of making sure that we have a watertight system to, to be able to be just as committed to our decision about competency as we would if we were doing full assessment. So there are our instructions. Again, every RTO will have their own template and you're most welcome to use the RPL kit template for the training organisation you're associated with if it's different to this one. So in the kit, it's essentially um, got the details around the candidate. Again, you would put the unit code and title. So let me just pop that one in down here. And you would fill in the details around the assessor's name, etc., etc. So in the bottom section, this part here is really your initial discussion piece around what evidence would you like the candidate to provide to you. So we're going to get that from unpacking the unit. So if we come back over here to our unit of competency, we're going to make some notes in our unpacking notes column. So again, I suggest that you either print off the unit from training.gov or you um, set it up in a mapping matrix similar to this, whichever works for you when you're putting together your um, assessment kit. But it's really important that you can pull apart the unit and not just base it on some high level things that you think a person should have. You actually drill down into the detail within each performance criteria. And this is the sort of thing that we do. So basically we would plan, uh, look at our performance criteria. 
So the first one, 1.1, says we're going to plan and document our presentation approach and intended outcomes. So that's kind of a logical step, number one, when you're going to prepare a presentation. So if you think about when you last prepared a presentation, what was the first thing that you did to really document your presentation approach and what the intended outcomes were? Again, no two candidates will be the same. So it may well be different for each person's workplace terminology around some of these documents. So you just need to describe it in the best way that you can so that when you talk about it with somebody else, they'll say, aha, that's what you want and I call it something else. So for example, um, if we're talking about planning and documenting the presentation approach, then we might be looking at maybe something similar to a session plan or a learning plan, um, or it might be a presentation um, checklist or something like that. So let's just call it a learning plan or a session plan. So it's really something that has that high level um, information around the outcomes. So by the end of this presentation, I want the participants to achieve blah, blah, and blah. So it's a sort of document that you would put that sort of outcome information into. Then the next part down is talking about more detail. So it's around what is the strategy you're going to use. So you've determined the outcome you want to achieve. Now what's the format and the delivery methods and things like that that you are going to achieve um, that would help your candidates achieve those intended outcomes. So that might be the more detailed session plan. So that could be, say, um, the detail of um, a checklist that might say, here's the resources I need, here's the location, here's the people that are involved. And then it could also be the actual minute by minute session plan that might say at nine o'clock, I'm going to do the opening and at 9.05, I'll do an icebreaker at 9.10, I'm going to cover off on this content. So um, again, whatever you call it, you would um, uh, put this information together. I'm just going to cut and paste that because I've forgotten to mention one very important thing. So this topic of indirect, direct and supplementary. So you may remember this from when we first did our actual um, uh, assessment theory content as part of this training program. I'd like to just pick up a document that is produced by ASQA and it's about collecting evidence from third parties. So it's a document, it's a fact sheet actually, that you can download from the ASQA website. So if you just Google ASQA collecting evidence, you'll find it. And it's a little fact sheet that you can um, pull down and save if you want to refer to things in the future. But it's all about using other parties to collect assessment evidence. So this is really, even though it is part of normal assessment in some cases where you've got a third party watching someone do things in the workplace and filling in an observation checklist, for example, it's quite relevant when you are talking about um, RPL. So I certainly encourage you to have a look at this fact sheet and um, read it in more detail. But it does give a really useful little description, again, just to refresh ourselves about what the differences are between the different forms of evidence. So it's essentially saying that evidence can be categorised as direct, indirect or supplementary. Um, direct evidence is the evidence that can be observed or witnessed directly by the assessor. So this is when you are involved in the collection of the evidence. So you are watching them do a workplace task or you are asking questions or you are administering the test and watching them do the test. So it is the strongest form of evidence because you know for a fact it's that person's work and that they're doing it today, so their skills are current. So it's very strong when it comes to the rules of evidence. The next form is our indirect evidence. So this is when it's something that you haven't been involved directly in, but it is evidence that the candidates can um, complete some of the work requirements or skill requirements of the unit. So it's saying here that it could be things like um, finished products, it could be a written assignment or a test, so you might set someone homework or an assignment to do in their time between classes or something along those lines. 
or it could be a portfolio of previous work performed. And then we have supplementary. And supplementary evidence is really anything additional to what you have set them as specific evidence requirements that will support their claim of competence. So this is where we're talking about reports from supervisors or colleagues, um, could be a testimonial, could be a work diary, could be um, a certificate of some training they've done. And certainly um, it could be, you know, really, I suppose a job description or a CV or anything like that. So it isn't necessarily a specific task or a specific um, activity that's been done, but it's something that goes to show that if the supplementary evidence item is authentic, that it could demonstrate that the candidate has um, done the skills and knowledge that are required in the unit. So these are very general. In some cases, they can be very specific, um, but certainly they go to support it. So again, we have these four rules of evidence around validity. So the first part of that just stipulates that the evidence must demonstrate um, the learner has the skills, knowledge and attributes as described in the unit. So don't bother having um, a candidate who gets all excited and just brings you their entire life in a shoebox to be um, reviewed as part of their RPL process. You don't want evidence items that are not relative to the unit of competency. So no matter how proud they are of that particular piece of paper, if it doesn't relate to the unit, you should very respectfully um, suggest they just keep that for another time and only focus on the evidence that can be 100% um, connected to the unit of competency. The next rule is sufficiency, and this is making sure that you have enough evidence to be able to make your judgment around their capability. So again, as with the other full assessment process, you need to ensure that you are confirming not only they have the knowledge, but that they have done it. So it's um, sometimes the situation where a candidate will certainly know how to do something, but they've never done it in the real world. So then you might have um, a requirement to do one of those challenge tests or an observation to make sure they could do it if they had to. And then you've got currency. So we wanna make sure that the evidence shows that they have the skills today or in the very recent past. So if someone did a TAE um, certificate, you know, back in 2010 and they've not worked in the vet sector since that time, even though they would have been competent at that point in time when they did their TAE, if you don't use a skill, you lose a skill. So really important to make sure that there is evidence, yes, that they completed that and they were deemed competent at that point in time, but what have they done since that point in time to maintain that currency? Otherwise, things could have changed and the industry requirements around competency may have changed and they may no longer be current in those skills. And finally, one of the biggest ones related to RPL is authenticity. So making sure that the evidence that's presented for assessment is the learner's own work. So it's really, really important that you have checks and measures in place to be able to verify. Do not believe that because someone has presented a certificate, no matter from what highfalutin organisation it comes from, that it is the real deal. Always have a process for verifying. So sometimes that can be getting certificates certified. The great news these days is the USI, which will mean that any VET program completed um, since 2015 uh, or any educational program completed since 2015 if it's nationally accredited will be recorded on the USI portal so you can get a transcript from there which has been verified. So you know there's quite a few ways of authenticating. You can ring and speak to a supervisor etc. So they're the important parts there. So back to our little kit. So the reason why I diversed there is that when we are putting our evidence guide together, we're going to define our evidence items as being either direct, indirect or supplementary. So if we were looking at this unit holistically to say, you know, what would be an example of direct evidence that we could get um, to say that someone could prepare a presentation, deliver a presentation and review a presentation, so you might get them to actually do that. So up here where we talked about this observation or demonstration, that would be an example of direct evidence. 
So we would um, put that in as our suggested item there perhaps, is we would get them to do an observation. Plus, if we're asking them some competency questions, so we have a conversation with them and we ask them a few pertinent questions related to the topic, again, that's direct evidence because you are involved directly in the collection of the information. If we're looking at indirect evidence, then perhaps that could be something more like they might give you a video um, of a presentation or presentations. So again, it's direct, indirect because you're not there live, but it's, um, it is showing that they, that they are doing a skill directly. So even though you're not involved specifically in the actual collection of the evidence, so these other items here will fall under this supplementary. And with most RPL, you're normally going to want some pretty standard things like a CV. Um, you might want a third party report or a re uh, referee's testimonial. I'm just gonna see if I can pop this onto the one page to make it easier. Um, so you might want a job description which would tell you about how long they've worked in a role that would be doing things like making a presentation. Um, and the job description might say, you know, the, the um, requirements of this position are that you do, you know, presentations as part of your job. Uh, you might have a um, reference or a third party report, or it could be anything where someone else has um, conducted a review. So that could be like a, um, a job review or performance review. So again, all these sort of standard things, if they relate to this topic, then certainly they can be considered as part of your supplementary portfolio. Again, if the job description said that they were working in a role that had nothing to do with making a presentation, then it's not a valid piece of evidence because it's really not connected to the unit of competency. But um, that's where you, you often have to have this discussion at the very beginning with the candidate, just to make clear, don't give me stuff that's not relative, but certainly if your job description describes roles that you have had in the past that relate to presentation making, then go for it. Okay, let's go back here and talk about a few others. So where it's got um, the presentation aids. So if it's got selecting presentation aids, materials and techniques, you might want some examples of those presentation aids. So you might, um, and again, there's no fixed ones that it says in the unit of competency. So it could be a PowerPoint, could be handouts, could be Props, you know, so whatever um, the candidate has used in their own context of making a presentation, you would want to see some of those. Um, and then so on and so forth. So you kind of go through the whole unit and you try and find something that would give you evidence of completing all these different um, performance criteria. So down here, I think it talks about selecting techniques to evaluate presentation effectiveness. So you might want um, um, participant feedback forms. So really when you're doing your unpacking, you're looking to try and find an evidence item that's gonna be able to connect with each of them, knowing that some of them, like your CV, job description, those sort of ones may cover all of them because they're going to the big picture of someone who's working in a role, preparing, delivering and reviewing a presentation. So you would just keep on with this, um, going through each of the performance criteria and coming up with a kind of um, solid list of different evidence items that might be required there. And similarly for your knowledge evidence and your performance evidence, when it comes to knowledge evidence, we want to capture that through our competency questions. So if you go a bit further on in the RPL kit, and we'll just come to that section next, we come to a part where we have a list of questions that we want to ask the candidate. So we might call this Q1, Q2, etc. 
So you might put together some questions based on the knowledge evidence requirements. So this is um, information or theory that the candidate needs to know. So you might put questions in that are very specific to that knowledge evidence. So, but you make them a bit kind of conversational. So can you um, tell me about three types of information collection methods that you use to support a review and feedback of your presentation. So it's kind of like uh, writing questions for a job interview. So you're looking at what's the criteria, um, selection criteria around the role. What do you need to know that person must um, have in their knowledge? Um, and you write questions that are going to lead you into a discussion about those. Um, so you would put that in for all four of those knowledge evidence items. And then when you're actually preparing for the candidate's competency interview, you would also maybe have some questions related to the specific portfolio they present you with because no different again to when you're doing a job interview you may look at someone's evidence and it may not immediately tell you exactly the story they're um, trying to present to you so you might have questions that relate to specific evidence like tell me about what this presentation was all about so that you understand what they did and how they did it so back up here in our categories of evidence, you would just complete this little table with what the specific evidence items are that relate to this unit of competency that you've selected for your um, assessment piece. The next section is um, really um, the part that gets filled out when someone actually does the assessment. So this bit is filled out when you have a candidate who produces their portfolio of evidence for you. So during your assessment process, um, you would need to come up with a potential candidate or your assessor may provide you with a hypothetical portfolio that you can use. So the idea then is that you would put in here a log number. So however many items that you have, and then you would put your description in. So they might give you a CV, they might give you a session plan, they might give you a PowerPoint presentation, they might give you a um, feedback form, um, they might give you, um, what else did we have on that list? They might give you a video of their presentations. So again, you would list their shoebox items. So whatever they bring you in their portfolio, you would list them all there. Again, these are all legal document evidence items. So very important to take care of them, log them the minute you get them so that there's no dispute that you've received what you've received. And when the candidate makes their initial inquiry, make sure that you tick to say that you have gone through and explained all the processes around RPL and given them a copy of the unit of competency and then some sort of guidance around this evidence items that you've come up with here. And you would obviously fill in their name and details. So we kind of have it in two steps as part of your assessment. You put together the kit, which is the template that sits on the shelf until there's a candidate who's ready to go ahead and RPL that unit. And then you take the template and you put their details into the file and save it in their record and that then commences your legal document around the RPL assessment process. No different to if you were doing it as full assessment. So um, when you go to do your RPL assessment, make sure you fill in the name and your assessor is yourself. So then you've got a more comprehensive list of evidence items. Then when the candidate comes along that you're filling in the actual real file for. You would fill in details like, you know, when is the assessment portfolio due to be provided? And then you'd have, again, a conversation about that. So the candidate commits to a date and how they're going to send it to you. And then you log the date that it actually arrives, which may or may not be the same date that they committed to provide it to. So as soon as it arrives, you then log all the individual items and you can keep going with as many as they provide you with. And that then gives you this item number. 
to um, assign to each individual evidence item. So there's no rules around how much you should have. It just needs to be sufficient to cover off all of these performance criteria that we've gone through and identified what the evidence items are. So then the next part of preparing your template is to put together um, what we call the evidence review, very similar to the mapping process that we went through when we wrote the full assessment. So in here, you have to cut and paste in all the unit um, requirements straight from training.gov, so no different to what we've just done over here. You cut and paste it over here for the unit that you select. And then the next part is that you need to just put together a few sample, um, t like a, a task that relates to the unit that you've selected and pop in here what the task is you're going to get them to do. So for this example, we're going to, if we need to, so if we don't have enough evidence otherwise, we're going to ask the candidate to give us a short five minute presentation on a subject of their choice. So if someone is able to stand and deliver for five minutes, um, then you would um, feel much more confident that they could prepare a presentation and deliver it on that. So in the template, you would put in a few behaviours related to that unit, particularly um, coming from the performance evidence side of things that you've seen in the unit of competency and the skills that are embedded within your performance criteria. So no different to when you wrote the observation checklist for the full um, assessment uh, tool that we've done previously. So you fill in those behaviours um, and then that pretty much completes, once you've popped your knowledge questions in here, the actual template. So then when it comes to conducting the RPL assessment, if we just refresh on that for a minute. So the first step is we take the blank template that you've already prepared we fill in the candidate's name and your name as the assessor and file it electronically or hard copy, however the RTO requires it to be filed, into the candidate's record because that now becomes a legal document. Then we log the portfolio items that they have provided after we've had that conversation with them about what we suggest they provide and then we log what they send us through. And we make sure that we've ticked off all our admin um, requirements to say that we've given them full information before they enter into the RPL process so there's no surprises on what's expected of them. So then once we've got um, the evidence items logged, then we do this evidence review. So you would have obviously a few more evidence items perhaps in, when you do this for real but let's have a look at maybe items number three and four. So number three is a PowerPoint presentation. Maybe we'll do two, three and four. So number two is a session plan. Number three is a PowerPoint presentation and number four is a feedback form. So we come here to our evidence review and we have to say to ourselves, if someone gives you a session plan, so remember our session plan was number two, does it show you evidence that they can plan and document their presentation approach and intended outcomes? So if you think that's a yes, and probably in this case it would be, you would have to look at it obviously to make sure that it had outcomes in it. But should it have outcomes in it, then you would put evidence item number two there. Does it show they can choose presentation strategies? And again, you'd have to look at it, but provided, oops, provided it did, you would put a two in there. It would always have presentation aids in a session plan. They normally have a column that says these are the resources that are required. It may even have a part at the top which um, talks about who's involved in the presentation and it may have a section in the session planning about collecting evidence or Q&A or handing out feedback forms or anything like that. So that one evidence item, for example, could cover off on all five of your first um, element there about the planning. It may also help support some of these delivery of a presentation ones as well, because in your session plan, if it has a section that talks about the desired outcomes of the presentation, that goes to support the intent of the presenter to actually start the presentation by 
going through the outcomes. So in the content, if it talks about that, you could even add it to that. Again, it would probably have um, about the presentation aids and also this Q&A and things to do with monitoring participants, perhaps. If it doesn't, then just leave it blank. So you can see how that works. If we have a look at number three, which is the PowerPoint presentation, so it's probably part of your strategy with your resources. It's definitely part of your presentation aids. Um, maybe not the briefing others, but it may have a slide that talks about the Q&A or the feedback. Again, you've got to look at each item and then make that decision. So you can see that this can be a little bit subjective and it can often involve a bit of discussion with the candidate because the candidate should also have a little bit of ownership here in supporting your requirement to be able to map their evidence. So if you map it initially and then you meet with them and have that interview, you can show them this exact document to say, well, here's where we're at. I can see that you've got good evidence coverage for you know, this one here, but we don't have anything for this one here. And they may say, oh no, that was covered in that session plan or it was covered in that presentation. And they can sometimes help direct you to um, parts of their evidence that may support some of these performance criteria. So effectively, you go through and you continue mapping for each of the items. So you've got a feedback form is the next one. So definitely this techniques of collecting feedback would be part of that. And down here with our reviewing, you've got a feedback form. So you've implemented the feedback and um, sought the reactions of the presentation. But a feedback form, for example, may not show you that you've taken that feedback and you've actually used it to make changes to your presentation for the next time. So if you were thinking about that particular performance criteria, you might need to have, um, uh, so you might have presentation review or reflection notes, and you might have um, a version one to version two of an updated presentation. So when you were going through and doing your own packing, when you got down to number three, you would probably have thought that that might be a good idea to make sure that you get something from them that shows how they've utilised feedback to make a presentation better. So if that was the case, you would then be able to put the six and the seven there on that one. So the ultimate goal is that you would have a few items against each of these performance criteria and your performance evidence and your knowledge evidence. And once you do, then you can tick over here to say, yep, hand on heart, I now have sufficient evidence subject to it being authenticated. And that's kind of a second step that shows me that um, provided the evidence is legitimate, that I can say, yes, that candidate has um, fully addressed that. So once you've done all the logging of all the evidence and then all the mapping, you would go through and tick which ones you feel comfortable with. And then you would potentially go back to the candidate and say, look, we really didn't get anything that shows how you use persuasive communication techniques, but that might then be picked up in your observation. So when you do your observation, you would put that in there and that's a more direct evidence item. So that would potentially then allow you to sign that off. Similarly, with your knowledge evidence, you might map in the knowledge questions that you've asked during that interview. So you might have specifics around asking questions that directly relate to that evidence there. And similarly, it might be about the items that you've already mapped up here that are around the same sort of content. So you start to build this picture between your different forms of evidence around making sure that you can cover off on everything in that unit of competency. So the goal is fill each of these evidence items up. And if you don't, then you need to go back to the candidate, show them exactly what's happened with this mapping process and show them what the gaps are and say to them, look, we're very close now. Look at this um, mapping document and you can help me 
um, help you to work out what evidence you might have to fill the gaps when I've done the mapping or they may be able to help you make your mapping a bit more robust if some of the evidence items they've provided do in fact come, cover some of the requirements here. So you go through, complete all that, tick all your boxes and then you decide whether you do or don't need to do your observation and conduct that if you do. And then you have your final competency interview record. Again, very important to make sure that all the administrative requirements are catered for. So they're well at ease, they understand the process, they know you're going to ask questions, they know how you're going to make that decision, particularly when you can show them the mapping to say, here's where we're at in terms of what I need to be able to determine, you, determine that you are competent. Um, you provide lots of feedback around that and then you explain what the appeals process is because um, if you don't deem them as competent because of a reason like not enough evidence or it wasn't authenticated or um, it wasn't directly related to the unit of competency etc or it wasn't current um, then the candidate certainly has the right to appeal that and perhaps have their evidence reviewed by another assessor and then you confirm whether or not they have any special needs to be um, catered for and, and if they're ready to go ahead. So once you've done all of that, you would then log in whatever the date is that you're doing the interview. Again, this is all part of your legal document that goes towards confirming that um, competency decision and you'd put in details about the time that it took. So it might be an hour, it might be two. So then you conduct um, your interview, you have your questions, you show the candidate the mapping, you go through all of that. Again, you're ticking satisfactory, you're capturing responses, taking as many notes as you can as you go through. And then you put in any comments. So you might have a whole page of comments. So if you're having a lengthy conversation with the candidate, just continue to take notes after notes after notes or ask their permission to record it. And sometimes it's easier just to record the competency conversation so that you've got a very authentic piece of evidence to back up the responses they gave. And then you can jointly come together to make this determination about any additional evidence required so if there is, you would then say what that is and you'd put notes in there about what is required still and you'd make a commitment with the candidate about how it's going to be provided and what the date is that it's going to be provided by. So again, you've got a very documented, very tight process around the commitments on both parties as to what's going to be done. So up in your comments column, you just put notes from the interview. You may also put notes in there where you verify your evidence with a third party. So again, no different to when you're doing a job interview. Once you've gathered all your evidence, you may then need to go and verify it by ringing past employers or ringing training organisations where training's been conducted from to make sure that the evidence provided is legitimate. So once all of that has happened, then you have to make a decision as at today, so not when they bring any gap content through, whether or not the evidence provided today is valid. So does it cover off on every single part of the unit of competency? If it does, you tick yes. If not, you leave it blank. Similarly, is it authentic? So do you know hand on heart that was to do with the work of the candidate? If it is, tick it. If not, um, leave it blank. Is it current? Does it show they have the skills today? Do you have enough? And is it consistent? So do all the dates line up and does it look like it's legitimate? So at that point in time, you then make a decision. So it may well be that you are deeming them as at today, not yet competent, but that doesn't mean they're not yet, they're, they're not competent. They just haven't given you sufficient or authentic or valid evidence to make that decision. So there's an agreement between the two parties that the candidate will go away and fill the gaps that you've shown them in your evidence-based approach, what the gaps are. They'll go away and get the extra evidence that you've noted up here in the extra evidence box. And then you would sign off and then you would date it. And then that file kind of sits in that closed state until such time as the candidate comes back with the additional evidence that's been required. 
and then you reopen the file, you go back to your original log of evidence and you add in the new things. So they may bring you more evidence that you've determined is required when you did your initial mapping. So then you just go back to the next little page with your mapping and then you add in where those extra items would fit into the picture to be able to give you that proper overview of what's required. So it's kind of like stage one, stage two of that. So then you would update your notes to put in additional notes advising what has been required and then you would be able to um, complete, you'd put in a secondary page with your decision outcome with a new date and new signature that would determine that they were now competent. And then that file gets handed to the RTO administration team who would normally moderate it and have a second set of eyes go across it before the certificate was issued. But again, it's a legal document. It's a very um, evidence-based process, so you can't you know, make decisions based on someone's really nice and they talk the good talk. You've really got to have the evidence that backs up your decision. So that's really it when it comes to the recognition of prior learning process. Again, pick a unit that you are very confident in understanding what the potential evidence items are and then um, follow the process using the template provided or the template um, which comes from your learning environment. Hope that's been helpful and uh, bye for now.